Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers for inside analysis and behind the scenes commentary about the most important news events in our community from Santa Barbara's top journalists and political leaders. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts. Tonight, we look behind these headlines. The political version of The Voice plays at City Hall as the council holds an open audition for those hoping to fill a vacant seat. Tempers flare at the Board of Soups as residents from CARP say they're fed up with stinky pot. Conservatives push back on the City Council's latest sweetheart deal with unions. And the school board moves towards an important expansion of dual immersion language studies. Our panel tonight, Josh Molina, who covers politics and policy for Newshawk. Nick Welsh, executive editor of the Santa Barbara Independent. Dale Francisco, conservative thought leader and former city council member, and Laura Capps, school board member and liberal social media influencer. Thank you all for <laughs> coming. So Josh, with Greg Art gone from council, the remaining six members held tryouts this week for a batch of would-be replacements. Uh, who among the applicants has the best chance of getting four votes to be imported by the incumbents? First of all, Jerry, I decided to come back to the show. You didn't have me as a guest last time. Um, last, last, last week's show was, was, was kind of boring. Thanks you know? a lot, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, Bonnie yeah. Raisin is your favorite, apparently, from reading your coverage. No, the, the 10 people interview for one seat on the city council. So it's super intriguing because you don't really see this happen very often. Most of the time, people run and they get endorsements and they raise a lot of money. And then election night, we have to figure out who's going to win. This is a straight shot to City Hall. And this person's going to serve till November. So it's and then it can run again. They can run again. It is very intriguing because you have people who would never mount an actual campaign who get to interview and the most awkward interview in the world. It's five minutes in front of everybody to see. And you have people asking you questions like, what is your opinion of Santa Barbara's uh, position on the environment? You know, it's like, how am I supposed to People who answer? shall be... Unnamed. Yes. Uh, Oscar. <laughs> so it's very intriguing. There are a few front runners. Gina Fisher, who's a county staffer for Joan Hartman, is a front runner. She's been campaigning for the seat for more than a year. Uh, she's already lined up a whole bunch of endorsements. She's been raising money. She's clearly the one to beat because she's very competent. She's triple smart. She, she, she's, she's very wonky. She knows her policy. She's been involved. Her Who resume else? is stellar. Uh, Grant House was on the council for eight years. He was on the planning commission for eight years prior to that. He's sort of an insider candidate. He's been around a long time. Everyone knows him at City Hall. So he's also somebody who could get some votes. And the interesting thing about him is there may be a little payback coming his way. He cast the tie-breaking vote that put Randy Rouse on the council to run for office back when Doss was uh, elected to the assembly. And uh, Grant shocked everybody because he went with a concert. Uh, Randy's a moderate leaning to the right and Grant's very far to the left. And everyone's like, oh my goodness, how could you do that? So there may be a little bit turnabout is fair play there. Um, a and bit the of a third. surprise. Yeah, I'm getting to it, Jerry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I know this is your personal know, favorite of the I, night. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, who, who was that? Uh, sneaking her way into my story was surprise candidate uh, Megan Froman, Froman Harmon. Harmon, Megan Froming Harmon, and uh, she was very impressive. She was the first one to go. Um, as far as I know, she's not the first one to interview. She's not been really involved in a lot of stuff, but she nailed the interview. I mean, if you were giving her points for how to interview. And she's met with every every member, she pointed out. She spent time with each of them. Yeah, so she worked it, so I'm sure she's going to uh, definitely get some votes up there on the council, and she may actually be the the compromise candidate because you've got some of the old school city hall people pushing for Grant House and then you have sort of um, you know, a lot the of the ideologues. Well, it's not 100%, but you've got some of the people on the left going for Gina Fisher. Maybe there's a compromise in the middle because that vote's probably going to be 3-3 and maybe uh, mm -hmm. Megan will, will slip in there. There were other, most of them interviewed very well. It was impressive. It uh, was impressive. It, it actually was a pretty, pretty good group. Uh, no, uh, what's her name? Heaton, who is uh, 
Brittany. He, mm. she been with the Neighborhood Advisory Council for three years. Um, she works you know, for she, the county. She works for the county public works and, the, and the transportation planner. I mean, she has massive uh, sort of expertise when it comes to government and, and sort of the mechanics of it. She's a little bit more austere low in key. her presentation low and low-key, key, but she... She also interviewed would be. well. Uh, she was going to basically renounce her home, her job at the county, everything, so that she could run for the city because of a potential Unlike conflict Hart, of who, interest. I mean, if Greg Hart dept for uh, twelve years, if but Greg that, Hart can serve, area. I don't know why she would need to. Exactly. Uh, but she did interview well too. Uh, th there were a lot of strong candidates. I, I'm going I'm to ask each of you who you, you've heard for. But first, Josh, here's the fact. Is Megan was the star of the evening. She was the breakout star of the evening. Uh, Gina, very smart. Everybody knew it, but she got outshined. I really thought by the by the new kid. And Grant was Grant. You know, he was kind of playing to the crowd a little bit, a little bit, and uh, that was kind of over the line. Well, well, Megan was the biggest surprise because <laughs> insiders like us think it's Gina and Grant, but she definitely <laughs> said, "Oh." Don't discount me, and so she, she, she's going to be there too. She's going to get some Break, votes. Breakout star. Who, who <laughs> have you heard from? Someone who? Well, first of all, thank goodness Josh is back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally, somebody. <laughs> because he just went on and on about my candidate, Gina Fisher. I think you know, she's. I, I don't have to come back next yeah. time. Yeah, that's, right? so. oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, Gina, Gina has such a strong breadth and depth in this community. She knows a lot. I've served with her on boards. She's super smart, and she works really hard. And I think if I were, I'd want to serve with her if I had the chance. What about who, 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 who did you think shined? You know, Shone? Scott yeah. Wren. Shine. Shone. You like Scott Wren. Uh, <laughs> good old Scott. I thought Scott did a pretty good job last night. I, I did, too. You know? I understand. In he's, fact, really, everybody. It's too bad he doesn't even, live in the district. <laughs> He does actually live in the district. I he's lived there for a long time. He's on Anthem. He but has he, a he has an asterisk though. I know. I yeah. Know. So what, what did you matter. think? What was your? I take thought on? that uh, I was impressed by the quality of the candidates. Even the fellow I'd never heard of before, uh, Matthew Namer, who came up last. Yeah, and, and he, he said he well, he would only take the. He would only serve for the. For Kate the, Carter. The interim. Kate Carter yeah. was was it was, was very good. Yeah, they were all good. Julia Lara. Julia I, Lara was really good. I thought um, Gabriel. Um, he was. Escobedo. Escobedo. He was really. I think he was really a. Surprise. And he had, he had the cheerleading squad with him. He too. had yeah, the he cheerleading did. squad. He was the millennial candidate. He all right, but the micro, question is. Tiny homes, microgrid. Yeah, all your all stuff, the talking points. All your right? stuff. Scooter, but the question is, who can get? Four votes because it's it's there's six, so who can get four votes? I would say that uh, Megan, not Megan. Um, I would say um, Gina Fisher is, is the most likely to get four. What do you think? I agree. I think it's between Gina and Megan, but because of Gina's, well, we'll talk a little more about this later about the influence of the DCC on City Council. Because of that influence, I'm leaning towards Megan. Hmm. Is the DCC backing Megan? No. no, they're not backing. Correct. Right. I don't know if they've. I don't know if they've made an endorsement. Well, Gail. Gail was there last night, and who was Gail backing? Come oh, okay. on, you know, give me a break. So who's going to get four votes? Uh, it's going to go back and forth, back and week. forth. Yeah. Right. It's not going to be easy. They're going to have to eliminate people. Um, probably Gina Fisher, um, because if she's qualified, you may not like her politics, but she's qualified and. Could be Grant, but there's here's the thing. Brian Barnwell tried to get appointed to a commission on the city council. He's like a Grant House type, yeah. an old school dude. Old news. He got Randy Rouse's vote. So I don't know how much of this young council, this new council, is really saying rolling out the red carpet for somebody All like right. Grant House anymore. We'll, it, we'll see. The correct know. answer is Megan Fremming <laughs> Harmon will be... The, uh, it the, will be it will be somebody new. I think we all agree on that. And will yeah. just be a series yeah. of votes. How is it, is it, is it, is it, is it true that Kathy doesn't like uh, Gina? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one to gossip about what happens behind the scenes, Jerry. Oh no! Well, why do you think you're here? Did you see behind the scenes commentary? That's what it says. All right, Nick. Tempers flared at the board of supervisors when a bunch of people from CARP showed up to complain about the implementation of the new uh, marijuana ordinance and. Das Williams, Dion of the... Uh, Can you say it with a little more contempt? Das Williams. 
who's uh, Come on, Jerry. favored Where by the uh, cannabis industry, uh, almost got into a fight with somebody, I understand, from reading your coverage. Uh, you know, he threw down. It, it, tempers definitely... I mean, you walked into that room, uh, and it was the, the board of supervisors. It was packed. It was it was like standing room only. There was an overflow room that was packed as well. People had come from Carpinteria. People had come from the San Ynez Valley, where the wine growers are upset about cannabis. Some people near Solvang were upset because a, a former Montecito Republican named Steve Deckers has now discovered cannabis up in, in, in the valley, and he has uh, 360 peti you know, people signing a Danish petition. Kush. The Danish Kush, right. <laughs> and then you had, you know, the Tepeste uh, Canyon people showing up. In the, so you had the red shirts from the south, you had the purple shirts from the north, and they all converged on City Hall. And what did they, they kind of, want? What do they want? Well, what they wanted, they want to freeze, they want to cap, they want just stop. Slow down. Whatever you're doing, stop. It's too much, uh, it smells too much. We're being uh, invaded by the smells. The wineries are upset that their, their tasting rooms are going to be uh, blown away by the vapors and the odors coming off the fields. And so they, they want some kind of a limit. Stop the train, it's, it's gotten too big. Didn't happen. It didn't happen, wasn't going to happen, but something did happen here. Two things. One, this is getting very uh, esoteric, but in the Ag 1 zone, which is sort of a small agriculture, they said no more uh, cannabis. Yeah. So they took that off the table, and that is sort of where farms kind of butt up against residential neighborhoods. So that was taken off the table. The second thing they were talking about in large ag parcels didn't go anywhere, but there was a serious push to have um, odor uh, control systems installed on, on those properties. It, it didn't make it, but the way it happened, it, you could tell that one is going to come back. What role does uh, Greg Hart's administrative aide, good golly Miss Molly Culver, play in all this? Was she not uh, She was, in a fact, chief consultant to the marijuana industry? She, she was uh, the chief consultant to the cannabis, uh, the county cannabis uh, foundation or whatever they call it, but she has uh, distance herself, or she has, you know, passed that torch on to a successor whose name now escapes me, and she is taking pain to say, now that I work for Greg Hart, I am no longer representing. Not the taking industry. their calls. I don't know. I mean, the problem with with Molly is that you know when you are as good at what she does as she is, and you were doing that for two years, um, people don't say, oh, guess what? Uh, their muscle memory keeps you front and center of the brain and they remember that you were the one. And what about the powers in Carpinteria formerly leading the uh, cut flower industry who are now uh, transformed into marijuana? What influence do they have? You know, I think that uh, in Carpinteria you had a lot of greenhouses and they had a lot of trucks with big refrigerators, you know, cruising up and down, you know, and, and all of a sudden you had uh, NAFTA come along and you had South American imports wipe out the, the Gerber daisy industry, right? So you have all these vacant greenhouses and these guys said, you know what? One flower is as good as the next and they packed them in with um, uh, cannabis. Do you see anybody anywhere, in either the city or the county, who's pushing back against this, who's an elect official now that Janet Wolf is gone? Pushing back against cannabis? Yeah. No, I don't. Yeah, it's well, just like... You should, I mean, if you paid attention, if you paid attention, Jerry. Uh, <laughs> I just read your stuff. I don't, I assume yeah. you're paying attention. Um, Why do I have to pay attention? Joan Hartman, actually, um, it was interesting because she's third district supervisor. She's got the winery. She's got a lot of cannabis. Uh, and she was there supportive of the industry and in, in legalization trying to get started. The wine, you know, the, the, rap, the response now on, on the wine industry is, well... Where were you when we were trying to put this ordinance together? That was your time to speak out. And by the way, 20 years ago, you were the big bad booty man destroying the landscape. And isn't it sort of hypocritical for you to come out now saying, oh my God, we're being destroyed by the new kid on the block, cannabis. Is it just the smell or are there other you know what? concerns? I Crime? Think, you know, I think that... Smell is like 90% of it, yeah. I mean, there's, there's crime, there's the high fences, there's the uh, security, 
uh, sense there's the bright lights. So if you're in like Sleepy Hollow and you're enjoying your bucolic life and all of a sudden you got a guard dog next door and you got some weird goons in uniform. Semi, uh, and the speed, right? I mean, 2,000, didn't I read 2,000 permits? I mean, it's, it's rapidly changing. Yeah, we are. Changing. Don't we have more yeah. than anybody, any, any other We county? have about one third roughly of all the licenses in the state of California. That's astonishing. I mean, more than humble, correct? More Talk than about humble. burying the lead. Gee whiz. I mean, that's I'm, just I'm a lot of change. More <laughs> than humble. We've already written that, Jerry. I can't believe you're just past <laughs> that. I say, I mean, if, 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 once Kelsey Brueger left, I believe your marijuana coverage is really full. Really tank. <laughs> no, I mean, what happened was, um, anyway, humble, they grow kind of much smaller scale operations and, and the way the law is in order to amass the acreage that we have here you have to put together lots and lots of different um, licenses in order to get so the uh, who's the czar at the county What's Dennis Bozanis. he's trying isn't he trying to like build the brand Santa Barbara Cush Santa Barbara whatever it is yeah no, he's basically a marketer right you know that's one way to look at it he I mean, the, the state passed the law, the voters voted for it, we wanted to have cannabis. I think Doss Williams to the south and Steve Labanino to the north said, you know what, it ain't oil money, and we need some revenues uh, for the county. People support it, There's a, there seems to be an infinite uh, appetite for it, so why not make some money? But it seems like it's, there's a difference between voting for legalization and, and then voting for a new industry to come in, correct? Right? Yeah, there is. And yeah. overwhelm the place. Parenthetically, yes. Lois Capps, former representative, head of the Cut Flower Caucus yes. in Congress. Would she now be part of the Cannabis Caucus led by <laughs> Representative Barbara Lee? You should ask her. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know what was interesting? And, and and our friend Annie Bardock is off the charts with this thing. She's she's got all she kinds is of leading conspiracy. A, a recall Doss Williams make him sleep with the piranha campaign. Yeah, all right. Could be an opening. Could be an opening. I'm just saying. All right, Dale. You had a couple of op eds published recently that were critical of the city's new PLA Project mm -hmm. Labor Agreement right. policy. What is a PLA? And what are your concerns, which I share about it? So <laughs> the project labor agreement is an agreement that essentially hands the control of a project over to the unions. That's really what it's about. The unions get to decide who gets hired on a job. They get to decide what the work rules Anything are. Anything five million and over? Is that what the- Five million and over is what the proposed ordinance said. Um, my concern obviously is that, well, even if that's all it is right now, there's no reason that the council can't say two years from now, well, it's working great for five million, let's lower it to one million, or let's make it just all public works projects. And, and, and why is it, I mean, it, to me, it was a solution in search of a problem. Absolutely. Because Greg Hart and Eric Friedman, too, who was a great disappointment to me personally, but... Um, uh, it's a bit harsh. <laughs> no, seriously. Because, On this issue. No, they kept saying, oh, this is going to help local uh, uh, workers, but it's it not was, at all. I mean, just from a procedural point of view, this was one of the most astonishing things I have ever seen Santa Barbara City Council do. This was a major, a, an, an enormous change in policy. This is Public Works has been bidding jobs for decades the same way every city in America biz jobs, and that's through a competitive open bidding process. If you're going to change that, you're at least going to ask for a staff report before you do it. You're at least going to say, oh, here's the problem. You know, this isn't working. This is how we can solve it. There wasn't any of that. No, Josh, as you recorded, uh, uh, it was a big jam job by Greg. I, I mean, what, did he lean on the staff? What happened? I don't think we should ever talk about PLA on television. <laughs> we just lost half of our interest. We were talking about you know, how social security interest rates are. Yeah. What? Was it? Or was I, it I, do you agree with me? We it was an extraordinary breach of process. It was very fast and it was very atypical for how City Hall usually. Can bets, you think of things. anything else that was a parallel to it? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, there was a report. Rebecca Bjork, Public Works Director, she did weigh in. Uh, but it was more of, 
we're going to have to figure it out later kind of thing, but we're going to go in this direction. So it was not, you know, it was not really good public policy, and I don't think anyone really understands it. I, I think that some people are saying, I oh, do. it's not that bad, and others are saying it's terrible. Here's the, here's the thing. You agree with me, do you not, no. Nick, that it was a complete betrayal of the people who voted for Measure C. For for to to raise the sales tax for infrastructure. Can you have a partial new... betrayal? Huh? Can you have a partial betrayal? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. betrayal is a betrayal. No, no, no. You can have a partial. No, I mean this is the deal here. What's going to happen? Nobody happens? talked about a PLA when they were out there. Randy Rouse is furious about this. You know what? You should start hanging out with Annie at some of these meetings. <laughs> um, I think. <laughs> You're just looking. You're, what are you waking up in the morning and what can I get agitated about? Um, I don't okay. sleep. I worry Here, about it. Here's that. the deal. I think what's going to happen is that uh, they're going to mug that thing in some back room and they're going to say, we're going to change. We're going to, the, the PLA is going to stay intact, but they're going to, instead of reducing the trigger mechanism, so they're going to make it only for much larger contracts. And, they're going to water it down. That's true. There has to be a long process, right? Or maybe yeah. delete it entirely. Or I mean, there's, 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 if there's a no, depending on who gets the depending on who gets who gets uh, put in that position in the vacant seat, that could change things. Um, there, what they said was we're going to have a PLA. Okay. Well, we saw what the county went through in yeah, negotiating one, and in the end, one of the one of the unions refused to right. sign it. So that went nowhere. So here's my conspiracy theory. This is my Pollyanna conspiracy theory, which allows me to sleep at night. This was a complete cram job by Greg Hart to pay off his union benefactors a priori at the city level so that when he goes to the county and those same unions say, Greg, we want your support on these oil projects inland. Ooh. They are going to put out hundreds of thousands of metric tons a year. Ray will say, dude, this is my get out of jail card. Boom, ah. I already paid you, leave hmm. me alone. Now, that is my theory. There is no evidence to Andy. support it. No evidence to support well, it. Welcome to yeah. Newsmakers with Alex Jones. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, we got it. So Nick, what about the more likely scenario that Greg says, look at the wonderful thing I did for you at the city. Now I'm going to do the same thing at the county. Salud couldn't pull this off, but I can. But I can. Well, the county already has a PLA. And it's not working. Is Greg going to run? No, it doesn't have a PLA because it never got signed. It never got signed. Okay. All right. If if all right, uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk about the Monique musical chairs later. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Laura. So two things on the on the school board. One you. You voted to take the first steps to install uh, dual language immersion studies. What is that and why does it matter? Because bilingual edu education is coming back and I think politically it matters a lot. Uh, we've seen a huge change from 1998 with Prop 227. Um, a lot of us remember that. It was very divisive trying to get rid of bilingual education and uh, this district, our district, made national news because we did it. And now we're there's been a group of parents, fortunately, that kept it going at then Cesar Chavez Charter School and now Adelante. And they're really paving the way for uh, what, by all accounts, studies show is a really great way for kids to learn. So it means you, it's, a way of, it's a way of learning bilingual by doing 50% of your language, English, and a partner language, often Spanish. But, or, or even more sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And it's good for your cognitive ability. It's good for your cultural sensitivities. It's good for your disposition. and even helps with the onset of dementia. I mean, there's uh, all of these ways, Please, studies. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Why do you point to me? I'm saying onset of dementia. We need to get the good right salsa. It's good for everything. You think it's a good idea? I had never heard that we were going back to bilingual education. Well, it's, it's beyond the, bilingual, isn't yeah. it? It's yeah. It's dual immersion, immersion is actually where um, it, the, both languages are taught about fifty percent, and so we're looking at um, a new program that will be um, in the junior high in. 
two years from now. So it's, we're taking time to figure out how the best way to do this, um, starting in seventh grade, and then also a program in the um, elementary school. But right now, the district does not have it. And it's the best way to does. language. That's when, if it, it, developmentally, people are uh, Exactly. Are... And there's 400 of these, 450 of these programs currently in the state of California since uh, 1998, when they were based, essentially banned. And now it's gr growing back. But the previous um, education secretary said, we need to be at about 1,600. So, the, the whole philosophy has changed, thankfully, from a very anti-immigrant time 20 years ago to one that's much recognizing the benefits of this. And there you have it. I saw finally something the school district did right. Okay. Now, I, the other thing that was Man, in the grumpy, news. Man, grumpy, grumpy, grumpy. <laughs> the, uh, at San Marcos, we yes, had another yesterday. incident. It amounted to nothing, but it just, once again, that's a troubled, it's not a troubled school, but there's a lot of unhappy people left over from the Ed Barron's thing. Yes. And you said from the dais that the most important thing we're going to do this year is pick the new principal. Yes, one of the most important things we're doing this year is to pick a new principal at San Marcos High School. They had a big scare yesterday. Fortunately, it's on Tuesday. Fortunately, it was nothing. There was not a gun scare. but a I radiator think, hose. But I think the communication system, as much as it was horrible that the students and their parents and, and the staff had to go through this, um, the I heard from some parents that they were pleased by the way in it which worked. it was handled. Yeah, and obviously the sheriff's department. I mean, and you know, the student the, the student did the right thing to to, um, to, to call 911 mm -hmm. when she thought she saw a man with a gun in the parking lot. So. What's the status of the principal search? It's ongoing and uh, and involving parents and involving uh, students and teachers, et cetera, but has yet to come back to the board. You're, you and uh, Kate Ford expressed some uh, early reservations about the process and whether it involved enough parents and Absolutely. enough of the community. Are you yep. comfortable with it now? Uh, not fully, not fully. I wish, I think that there could have been more involvement of parents at the beginning. Yeah. But they will be part of the interview process uh, when that is when it's to that point when there's finalists. All right. Anything new on the Baron suit? Uh, not that I know of. <laughs> Maybe you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're expecting a, a ruling out this week, aren't they? It's well, they all about the secret memo right. that hmm. that was allegedly used, according to Barry Capello, who's representing former Principal Ed Barons, that was allegedly used to oust him, even though he never had the chance to respond to it. I know you can't talk about that, but is it true or not? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks to uh, Josh Molina, Nick Welsh, Dale Francisco, and Laura Capps, and thank you for watching. Please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, to check out my blog posts on politics and media in Santa Barbara and beyond, and our YouTube channel, where you'll find an archive of past shows and interviews should your insomnia be particularly troublesome. Thanks again to our director, J.P. Montalvo, to our crew, Lizzie, Ryan, Elliot, Andrew, and Vincent. And as always, to our high-ranking, senior, high-powered, high-energy executive producer, Hap Freund. Thanks, we'll see you next time on Newsmakers.